Let's start the discussion with internal memo a couple of years ago. Back then, we expected the majority of AI use cases would be our ranking system, including ads and Instagram. We foresaw that the need for GPU cluster would not go beyond 4K. Anything exceeding 4K would be a bespoke planning procedure. And of course, Gen AI happens in 2023, and that changes all of our previous forecasts. This is a graph showcasing the increasing demand of interconnecting more GPUs, especially for large model training. We started out slow from 2020 to 22, believing that the small-scale training cluster will be sufficient for our use cases. Then the demand has skyrocketed since 23 and quickly became exponential from 23 to 25. Like we mentioned, this is all because of the Gen AI disruption starting 23. Researchers have developed a much larger AI model for text, image, and video generation, which in turn needed tens of thousands of GPU to be trained in the same network. The sudden change was stressing the network even more. Unlike the traditional TCP network stack, AI training expects the network to be both lossless and even lower latency. To address these challenges, we'll talk about our journey of scaling AI network with DSF, the dis disaggregated schedule fabric. I'm Ron, software engineer from FPOS team. Hi, everyone. This is Ankur, network engineer at Meta. Before we start DSF, let's go over the traditional approaches in the class based network and some of the existing challenges. Let me start by talking about three main challenges which we have faced with the traditional IP fabric. The first one is elephant flows. Training workloads produce long duration heavy flows which single-handedly can congest a link they hashes onto and can create head of the line blocking and stress switch buffers. The next one is low entropy. Typically a IP flow is a combination of source IP destination address and port numbers. Now depending on the size of the job, and number of GPUs involved in the collective communication, the number of unique flows could be very few. This results into poor hashing, and we result into a situation where there are few flows, few fabric links, which are getting congested, while there is a lot of capacity available in the fabric. The last one is suboptimal capacity utilization. Now, as an overall effect of ent uh, entropy problems and the elephant flows, we have observed that there is a large skew in the bandwidth utilization of fabric links. This is an important factor to decide into how much should we over-provision our network to allow for fast pace maintenances and keep the fabric performance unaffected in case of failures. Now to mitigate these problems, at first we tried few routing solutions. For example, we crafted BGP, BGP policies on leaf switches such that any incoming traffic from the accelerator will be hashed, will be pinned to a specific uplink. Now, you may call it a very naive form of T, but it worked well in case of uh, steady state conditions. But in case of link failures and node failures, the fallback was ECMP. And we again start hitting into the same problems. We then tried load aware ECMP, which was difficult to tune, although it helped with the cases we mentioned, mentioned before but it was difficult to tune as the network size grew. And it created out of the order packets, which we know it's very detrimental for the RDMA communication. We then created a sophisticated traffic engineering solution, which would pre-compute all the flows depending on type of model we are going to run and pre-configure the switches for optimum load balancing. Now, this also helped for the problems we just stated, however, it was slow to react to the failures, and it became too complex as the size of the models multiplied and the size of network grew. So by this time, with all the experience behind us, we knew that we need to create a fabric which can solve all these problems at the core of its architecture and promises close to optimal load balancing, guarantee no out of order packets, and by design, avoid the congestion at the fabric layer. In rest of the talk, we will discuss how DSF works 
dual stage network for Gen AI networks, for Gen AI applications, some innovation around DSF fault handling, and some exciting stuff ahead. Now with that, let's dive into how DSF works. Let's rewind the clock a little bit and see how we landed on the idea of DSF. There exists a small-scale industry solution in the form of routing chassis, where fabric cards and line cards are interconnected within the chassis. However, the size of the chassis limits the size of the network we can build. To achieve a larger scale, we ask ourselves, why don't we break the physical limit of the chassis, disaggregate the line cards and, and fabric cards into individual devices, and build a logically large switch by connecting them into the same domain. This enables us to construct a much larger net network, and also how DSF earns its first letter D, as in disaggregated. One of the reasons we started on the journey of DSF was because we have experiences with both chassis-based system and also distributed system. From the early days of building Meta's aggregation layer to the current days of Meta's um, disaggregated network devices. No one in the industry has attempted this scale, where Encore will cover later on the building blocks of DSF and topology for Gen AI. Note that this is a smart fabric, and hence there's no need for smart NIC. This allows DSF to accommodate the heterogeneity of GPU and AI accelerators. Now let's see what the second letter S, S in schedule, being another characteristic of the network. To understand that, we'll look into the end-to-end -end packet flow from GPU-A to GPU-B. First, GPU-A will first send forward the packet to RDSW-A, which is the disaggregated line cards. Prior to RDSW-A sending the traffic towards the fabric, it will first send a credit request towards RDSW-B asking, hey, do you have enough buffer to accommodate my packet? If yes, RDSW-B will reply with a credit grant saying, yes, I do have enough buffer to accommodate a packet. This is the reason for being a scheduled fabric, as it's using the credit-based congestion control algorithm. To ensure the optimal usage of the network, RDSW-A will break the packet into smaller cells and spread it across all the available FDSWs, which are the disaggregated fabric cards. These FDSW will then forward the cells towards destination RDSW-B, in which the packet will be reassembled in the hardware and eventually forward back to GPU-B. This simplified example highlights the optimal load balancing with DSF, especially for elephant flows with low entropy. With the schedule fabric understood, let's see how we scale the AI network with DSF, especially for Gen AI use cases. Thank you, Ron. So using DSF technology, we first built the fabric for the non-Gen AI applications. This was announced last year at the OCP. Please check it out later for more details. Today, we will focus on the DSF fabric for Gen AI applications. Here we are looking at the network topology of a single DSF AI zone. Consider this as a building block for the larger Gen AI clusters. I know this slide looks busy, but let's try to dissect and understand it better. So each AI zone is divided into multiple scaling units. Each scaling unit is a collection of GPU racks connected to leaf switches RDSWs in a real optimized fashion. All RDSWs inside the zone are connected to common layer of fabric switches called FTSWs. This is a non-blocking architecture. And to support the required scale, we created two planes which, we are, which are identical to each other. Now let's try to understand some traffic patterns inside the zone. Let's assume there is a job which can fit within a scaling unit and the traffic stays within a rail. It can get directly switched at the single hop RDSW providing a low latency path. Now this is really beneficial for the collectives like all gather and reduce scatter and all reduce, which are latency sensitive. But in case traffic has to exit the rail or exit the scaling unit, the ingress RDSW will convert the IP packets into the cells and spray it over the fabric. The egress RDSW will assemble the cells and send the IP packet out to the egress accelerator. Now, as you may have already noticed, DSF does not depend on number of flows. One flow or many, it really does not matter. And because each IP packet 
is converted into equal size cells, the capacity utilization is near ideal. Together, this one single zone provides a capacity, provides a scale of 4.6K 800 gig GPUs. And we also call it L1 AI zone. So now let's see how we build a larger cluster using this building block. We then connected four such AI zones using a dual stage of spine layer. The switches are called STSWs. And from hardware point of view, the STSW switches are same as FDSW, just a different function. Together, all these four AI zones acts as a single DSF unified fabric, which is fully scheduled. Together, it provides a scale of 18K 800 gig GPUs. And just to put into a perspective, this is one full entire data center building, leaving space for supporting services and front-end network. Now for the models, which needs more than 18K GPUs, let's see how we support that. We then interconnected five such buildings using a special pod called Edge Pod. It has 40 fabric switches and 128 Edge DSF switches called EDSWs. Each EDSW connect to a layer three super spine using 16 800 gig links, collectively providing a capacity of 2,800 gig ports per building. Now, since this is a layer three super spine, we need to exchange the routing information. We do that by creating BGP sessions, IBGP sessions between EDSW and all the leaf switches inside the building and EBGP between EDSW and layer three super spine. All the routing information is summarized and we need to only exchange aggregates between the building. Now, depending on how we shard the models and map the parallelisms across the building, the amount of traffic which crosses the building is very low. For that reason, the oversubscription of 4.5 is to 1 is just fine. One thing I must mention here, since this is a non-DSF L3 interconnect, the sum of the problems which we stated earlier tend to come back. However, due to super low volume of traffic, the impact is less profound. Now let's take a packet walk, look at that packet walk and understand it better. Let's assume there is a GPU A in building 1, wants to talk to GPU B in building 2. It sends the IP packet to its directly connected RDSW, the leaf switch, which in turn converts that packet into cells and send it over to EDSW. EDSW will again assemble the cell and send it over to the layer 3 super spine, which hashes on to the egress EDSW. And the reverse process. EDSW will again convert the IP packet into cells and egress RDSW, combine it into the IP packet and push it over to the egress GPU. Now to put into the perspective, this is one entire data center region. Now let's look into how we handle the complex failures inside such a massive cluster. It's all fun and games until failures occur in the network. Like we mentioned previously, by breaking up the packet into smaller cells and spread across the network helps us achieve the optimal load balancing. However, in the face of remote link failures, the other side of the network might not have enough capacity to handle all the cells and hence causing severe congestion. There have been attempts to solve this problem at the source and destination of GPU hosts, but input balance mode is an innovation in DSF that can optimally balance the traffic even in the case of link failure. Such capability allows the network to be GPU and NIC agnostic. The idea of input balance mode is pretty straightforward. For any DSF devices, their input capacity should be less than or equal to the output capacity. No oversubscription should happen in the network, even in the case of link failure. For those devices experiencing link failure, they will propagate this information to the, all the neighbor devices and notify them to send proportionally less traffic. Let's take a closer look at how it works. Imagine we have this mini-scale DSF network where we have two AI zones connected by SDSW, the spine layers. In the pristine state, all the layers will be used to forward cells to achieve optimal load balancing. Now, now let's imagine there's a link failure 
happening on the right-hand side of AI Zone 1, disconnecting FDSW1 and RDSW3. From FDSW1's perspective, it's losing 100% reachability towards RDSW3, and that information will be propagated to both of the SDSW, where they both of them realizing they can no longer reach RDSW3 via FDSW1. This is where input balance mode kicks in. Because both of the SDSWs are losing 50% of output capacity, maintaining the same input capacity will cause congestion in the spine layer. To relieve that situation, SDSWs will both pick 50% of the link and stop advertising reachability towards those downlink. Let's say SDSW0 pick two links towards FDSW0 and SDSW1 doing the same towards FDSW1. After this, input capacity and output capacity will be balanced in the spine layer. The same algorithm takes place in the FDSW layer retracting 50% downlink reachability towards RDSW. When the protocol converges, all layers of the DSM network are losing 50% reachability towards the destination RDSW3, which is equal to the percentage connection loss between RDSW3 and rest of the DSM network. With input balance mode, we relieve the buffer utilization in the spine and fabric layer, ensuring no congestion should occur in the face of network failures. I'm sure we just pour a lot of information and hopefully find it interesting. Let's see some of the performance results of DFSF and exciting future works. To share some bits on the DSF fabric performance, we are looking at the performance of an all-to-all -all collective run on three different GPU sizes, 128, 256, and 512. What we are measuring here is the bus bandwidth when the collective is run inside one single DSF zone and when it is compared to be run on our interzone crossing the dual stage spine. And in both the cases, as we can see, it can comfortably reach the theoretical calculated roof line. Now, all to all is a bandwidth intensive collective. It can produce a lot of traffic, create in-cast and congestion. And clearly, DSF can handle the congestion pretty well. And for the hierarchical collectives, it's the latency bound game. Now, this was nickel micro benchmark. Let's look at how a real training job performs. In this graph, we are showing when a Gen AI job is placed inside a single AI zone and when it is placed inside interzone crossing the dual stage spine. And in both the case, the performance of the job measured in word per second looks pretty similar. Now, I would like to share some of the exciting stuff which we are doing it in future. We are going to connect multiple data center regions to create mega clusters. This brings an interesting problem of long distance training and the heterogeneity of GPU and the fabric types. Among many other, we are also working on an interesting feature called hyperports, which can combine four 800 gig links into one single 3.2 terabyte link at the ASIC level. Now, this helps to reduce the impact of elephant flows pinning to a port. This is really beneficial for IP-based interconnects. Now, lastly, DSF is a smart fabric, and it naturally supports different GPU and NIC vendor types. And in future at Meta, we are continuing to scale our deployments using DSF with different vendor and GPU types. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Thank you for listening.